In this video, I'm going to talk about electron affinity. Now, what exactly is electron affinity? Electron affinity tells you the energy change that occurs when an electron is added to a gaseous atom. It's basically the opposite of ionization energy, which tells you the energy that's needed to basically ionize a gaseous atom to remove an electron from it or you can remove an electron from a gaseous ion too. So that's the basic idea behind electron affinity. Now what are some trends of electron affinity? Well the trends could vary are pretty widely but for the most part as you go towards the right the energy release becomes more exothermic. Now there's a lot of exceptions and as you go down, it generally becomes less exothermic. So let me give you some numbers so you can see this. So let's consider lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. Now lithium releases about negative 60 kilojoules per mole upon the addition of electrons to it. For beryllium, it's simply a positive value. Boron is like negative 27, carbon negative 122, nitrogen is greater than zero, it's endothermic, not exothermic. Oxygen is a negative 141. Fluorine is pretty high, it's highly exothermic, negative 328. And the noble gases are endothermic upon the addition of an electron. Now let's look at the other elements like chlorine, bromine and uh, iodine. So chlorine is about negative 349 and bromine negative 325 and iodine negative 295. So as you can see as you go down it becomes less exothermic however chlorine is an exception. Now as you go to the right it does become a little bit more exothermic but as you can see there's a lot of uh, endothermic values as well. So we're going to talk about these things. Now, if you ever get a test question where you have to find out which element is most exothermic upon the addition of an electron, or which one's going to release the most energy when you add an electron to it, what helps me is these sets of numbers, 76, 45, 13, 28. These are group numbers. Group 7 is the most exothermic group. The halogens, they really want to have an electron. And once you give them an electron, they become very stable. Fluoride, chloride, bromide, these are very stable ions. And anytime you create a stable product, in the process of creating that stable product, a lot of energy is released. So group seven is the most exothermic group. And then it typically goes in this order. Remember, this is just a general trend. Group six is the second most exothermic group. And then it's group 4, and then 5. Now, nitrogen is endothermic, so you might think group 3 is actually more exothermic than 5, but if you look at the other elements that are in these groups, like silicon, phosphorus, germanium, and uh, arsenic, they're exothermic as well. Silicon is negative 134, and germanium is negative 119. Phosphorus, negative 72 and arsenic, negative 78. So looking at these values, group 4 is, for the most part, more exothermic than group 5. But nitrogen is just weird. It's endothermic, and we could talk about that later. But group 4 is more exothermic than group 5 on average. And then group 1 tends to be more exothermic than group 3. And group 2 and 8 are, for the most part, just endothermic. Not all of them, though. Magnesium is endothermic, but calcium is slightly exothermic. And the same is true for strontium. However, the noble gases, pretty much, if you look at the periodic tables that you could find in uh, Google Images, if you type in electron affinity values with it, you'll see that the noble gases are endothermic. Now, let's talk about why.
So first, why is it that the alkaline earth metals are endothermic, but like group three is exothermic compared to it? So if we look at beryllium, the configuration is 1s2 and then 2s2. To add an electron, you have to place that electron in a higher energy level, in a 2p orbital. And whenever you want to place an electron in a higher energy level, you got to put energy into it. And so that's why the alkaline earth metals, they're not very exothermic. In fact, some of them are endothermic because you, you got to put energy to put this electron in its higher position. And the same is true for the noble gases. Let's take in uh, neon, for example. Neon has the electron configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Now, if we're going to add an electron, we have to place it in a 3s orbital. And so anytime you want to put a new electron in a higher energy level, it's going to be an endothermic process. And that's why the noble gases are all endothermic. Because when you're adding an electron to it, you have to place that electron in a higher energy level. Now, if you look at the halogens like fluorine, fluorine ends in 2p5. And so it has space to add an extra electron. And so it really wants to fill that last orbital. And so when it does so, it releases energy. You're not placing an electron in a very high energy level. And plus, the nuclear charge on fluorine is pretty high. As you go towards the right, the nuclear charge increases. So the fact that fluorine is relatively small compared to like carbon or nitrogen, and it has a high nuclear charge for being in a second row, it really wants an electron. It has a strong affinity for that electron. And once it gets it, it releases a lot of energy. So factors such as nuclear charge, atomic size, those play a role. Now let's look at carbon and nitrogen. Why is it that nitrogen is endothermic but carbon is not? So carbon ends in 2p2. Nitrogen ends in 2p3, if you write the configuration. So if we add a new electron to carbon, this electron is not going to have any issues. But if we add one to nitrogen, notice that we're adding a paired electron. And so there's going to be some electron repulsions. And that's why adding an electron to nitrogen is an endothermic process due to this uh, electron repulsion. But adding it to carbon, it, it's not, you're not going to have that issue because carbon has a vacant orbital. It has a spot to fill that electron. Now granted, elements in the same group as nitrogen are not all endothermic, like phosphorus and arsenic. However, that's a terrible looking P by the way, group 4 tends to be more exothermic than group 5 due to the fact that we're comparing an unpaired electron with a paired electron. And so that's why we have the number 76, 45, 13, 28. On average, Group 4 is more exothermic than group 5 because it's easier to add an unpaired electron than a paired electron. Now, let's say if you're given a question and you're given five elements, chlorine, sulfur, silicon, sodium, and magnesium. Now, you want to rank these five elements in order of increase in electronegativity in the sense that you want to rank it from energy changes that are endothermic to those that are most exothermic. So to do this, knowing these numbers help. 76, 45, 13, 28. So going this way, you have elements that are most exothermic when dealing with electron affinity. And these two are for the most part endothermic. So therefore, the one with the lowest electron affinity is going to be magnesium. Magnesium is found in group 2. 
Sodium is in group 1, silicon is in group 4, sulfur is 6, and chlorine is 7. So magnesium is going to be uh, endothermic with reference to electron affinity. Next is going to be uh, group 1, which is sodium. That's going to be slightly exothermic. And then after that, so we've finished 2 and 1. Next we have uh, group 4 which is silicon. So silicon is more exothermic than sodium when you add an electron to it. And then we have sulfur and then chlorine. So adding an electron to chlorine is going to release the most energy. And adding an electron to magnesium will not release any energy. It's, in fact, you need to put energy into it to make it work. And so I find that if you know these numbers, it can help you to identify which element will release the most energy when you add an electron uh, to its gaseous atoms. So that's it for this electron affinity video. Hopefully it gives you a good understanding of this uh, concept. So thanks for watching.